Mickey Willis. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Mickey Willis, you're an interesting character. I've got to say that. Now, what do you mean by that? I think all will be revealed throughout the course of the conversation, but I'm going to start out. What drives you to tell your truth? Well, some might find this trite, but it's really my children and a promise that I made during the birth of my first child who was born not breathing. And it looked, it looked bad. It looked like he wasn't going to make it. And uh, after probably, uh, maybe in reality, it was a minute, but it seemed like it was 15 of them trying to resuscitate him. I, I started to pray. And I've, I, I will admit, I've never really been a praying man. I wasn't raised with any kind of formal religion or anything like that. But I do respect the powers of the sacred. And, um, and so I started to, to pray and, and, and made a promise that if my child made it, that I would be in service to that child and, and all, all children, really. I've always loved kids. I've, I've, since I was a baby, I loved babies. Uh, my sons are like that now. They're two, they're seven and 10, and they're always going, Dad, look at that baby. So cute. And so I just, you know, it really came from that. And it was such a serious moment that I, I knew that that was a vow that I couldn't break. I've broken vows before. I was married once before, and, and that, that didn't go exactly the way that I envisioned it going. And so when I got married the second time, I kept my vows and realized this, the strength of our word when we put our word out like that. And so really, I, I made that promise. And, and, uh, and then when all this stuff came up and I realized that kids are really being targeted and, and they don't have the same future that I had to look forward to when I was a child same ability to ride down the street on their bike and go hunt for crawdads and all the fun stuff that I got to do as a child. It's a different world now. And so my, my, my hope is that we can, you know, we can pass on that beauty of childhood to the future generations. And so that's honestly the answer that that's what motivates me. Yeah, I, I wonder what it is about near death experiences, whether it be with ourselves or people close to us that have that, that impact that that spiritual impact for people that weren't ordinarily spiritual. And I'm experiencing a lot of that in my own life, Mickey, becoming way more spiritual. I'm absolutely not religious at all, but I've become deeply spiritual and connected. And the more I do that, really, the better my life becomes. And I know from reading about you and, and conversations we've had, your life is rather extraordinary in many ways. You come from an amazing Hollywood background, which I wondered if you'd just share a little bit of your bio about what you've been doing prior to this. I'm not sure that it was amazing, but I definitely come from a Hollywood background. Um, you know, I kind of fell into it. I, I didn't have the dream to be famous or, 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 you know, to be an actor or anything like that. I was really escaping my hometown of Sacramento, California, and, and kind of fleeing my past, which was my brother and mother died in the same month, well, 30, 34 days apart. And, um, and I just wanted to put it all behind me and start over because even being with family was a reminder, you know, and so it's like, let's start new, let's in a new environment. And, and I had already been in, mu in music, I was in a band. And so it felt like, well, I guess entertainment is, is really what's there for me. And so let's go check this Hollywood thing out. And I didn't last long. Um, I, I had an offer right away when you come to Hollywood and, and, and you're young and you're you know, de decent looking, there's a lot of vultures that come out right away. And so I uh, right away had people coming up, you wanna model and do things like that. And, and I was never interested in modeling, but you know, one offer came through and it was you know, going overseas. And, and I was raised with very little money. And so the idea of traveling and getting to see another country was, was something I couldn't pass up. So I took it and um, did a little modeling overseas and hated modeling immediately, hated posing, hated, hated all the, just, you know, the auditions where you just stand there and everyone's looking at you and talking to each other and taking notes. And it just felt so bizarre to me that it lasted for about a year and a half. Um, and then I, you know, I went into something far more honorable and meaningful acting <laughs> and, uh, 
but I, but I actually fell in love with the craft of that. I really did. I wasn't, I wasn't that good at it. Um, but I really appreciated the, almost the psychotherapy that comes with it of really exploring the emotions and, and, and finding new uh, expressions of, of, of yourself. And so I did that for a little while and that didn't last long. Um, but uh, I found my love on the, on the, you know, other side of the camera. Brilliant. And you've done some uh, amazing producing and filmmaking and writing in the past as well. And we'll go into that in a minute. There's a quote from my book, Mickey. Uh, it, re it relates to a, um, an experience that I had when I lost all of my money trying to double it to take home two uh, high class strippers that were offering their services further. And I lost all the money. And, and the quote I use is like watching planes, uh, watching passenger jets plow into the Twin Towers, I couldn't believe what was happening. What's your experience of 9-11? <clears throat> well, I was in New York. I directed my first movie, and I was there to negotiate a distribution deal on 9-8. And, and a strange part of the story that I, I rarely tell, I'll, I'll go ahead and share it with you right now, and that is the person I was staying with, he was actually produced the Howard Stern Show, and he was a friend of mine. And we went out to dinner on 9-9. And during the dinner, he found out that I'd never visited the World Trade Center. I was staying at his place. And he said, what are you going to do tomorrow? I'm at, I'm at work. And, you know, you should go do something. It's your last day here. You leave on 9-11. And uh, go check it out. And during the dinner, he became obsessed in, in the weirdest way. You know, looking back, I'm always like, God, so weird what was driving him. Because he literally wouldn't stop until I promised him that I would get on the subway, he drew it on a, on a napkin, and that I would go to the World Trade Center. And finally, I said, his name was Doug. I said, Doug, why do you care? Why do you care so much that I go to the World Trade Center? There's so many other things to see in New York. I'm, I'm not really interested in seeing, I'm not a tourist, that kind of guy, but I'll go. But why do you care so much? And he said, well, you know, go, go into the building, go up to the top, look at the view. Of course, it's spectacular. But you know what, I want you to stand at the base of these buildings and then I want you to look up and I want you to just consider what a joke it was that they tried to take those things down a couple of years ago. Because if you remember, there was a bomb went off in the basement of the World Trade Center a couple of years before they were, a few years or so before they went down, there was a, another terrorist attack. And I said, wow, that's strange, but okay, I'll do it. And so I went and, and went to the World Trade Center for the first time. And I took a photo of me standing at the base of the building, looking up at it and I, so I could show it to Doug and say I was there. And the, the, the morning, the next morning, um, he woke me up and, and was just white like a ghost and was pointing at the TV saying they bombed us, they bombed us. And the TV was on and the, one, one of the World Trade Center was, was on fire. And so we basically went up onto his roof and watched everything happen and then got, jumped on bicycles and went down to the scene. And long story short, it was a life-changing experience, as you can imagine. I'd never experienced anything like that. And we were suddenly thrust in the middle of, you know, ground zero um, havoc and, and stayed for three days and did search and rescue, which was ultimately body recovery and, and body part recovery and saw a lot of things that, that um, could really mess a person up. But during the experience, I realized that I was standing at the crossroads with a choice of e either allowing that to take me down or lift me up. And thank God I, I chose for it to lift me up. And I created a film company called Elevate as, as a response to that experience and left Hollywood and, um, and got a divorce from my first wife, who was fantastic, but uh, it just didn't work out. And really, really had to reinvent myself. And I thought I was done, completely done with anything creative because I, outside of Hollywood, I, I didn't know what arena I could possibly participate in. And it took me about a year and a half to create some new possibilities and came back into the game and created something called Elevate Film Festival. And that blew up overnight and became the largest single screen film event in the world, which was essentially a film challenge we would challenge filmmakers to go out in the world and find out what's right with the world and what's right with people because I was just so tired of the negative news. And, and that lit a fire in me to continue doing that work on my own to try to find truth through the medium of, of the, the power of film and storytelling. That's heavy. That's heavy. And, and that, that experience 
Have you been able to rise above? Is there any legacy from that experience? Any negative legacy? Negative leg legacy? No, no, not, not whatsoever. I had a little bit of lung issues <clears throat> that didn't occur for a few years later, probably, I think it was 10 years later that I actually had a pretty major lung infection and almost drowned in my own fluids. Um, but I took care of that because, um, you know, there were a lot of things that uh, a lot of people that I was with didn't make it. Um, it it's, you know, there were a lot of uh, stuff that we were breathing. But that was the moment, too, that I don't I don't want to gloss over that moment, because that was a real life changing moment for me was the moment when someone was directed to come around to tell all of the rescue workers that we should leave unless we have a a um, proper respirator because what we were breathing would eventually kill us. And it was a very serious announcement. And um, to my surprise, no one left. Everyone stopped after the announcement, they looked around, they took a deep breath and, and then machines fired back up and everyone went back to work. And it was a real moment of like, wow, I'd never experienced such selflessness of a collective of people before in my life that were just told that you being there will, could potentially kill you and no one left. At, and at that point we were well into two days into it. So it was very slight chance we would find one survivor. And yet at the very slight chance, people were willing to risk their own lives. And I stood there and I just kept saying to myself, this is who we are. Like all the rest is the show, but this is who we are. And humanity is amazing once we get beneath all of the stuff that distracts us. And so that is that that was the moment that it, it I, I'll never shake that. that I left with that. And look, speaking of putting yourself in harm's way, would you share with us what is Plandemic? Well, Plandemic is a, a movie series uh, so far that we've, we have Plandemic 1 and Plandemic 2, Indoctrination, that was released in the world. Um, the first one released May of 2020. And the third one we're working on right now. We're in production on it right now. And ultimately what it was was... Um, I had met a doctor named Dr. Judy Michaelvitz, who just left today, just did her new interview for Plandemic 3 this morning. And um, I had met her about a year, year and a half before the pandemic was announced. And uh, I'd mentioned earlier that my brother had died. He died of AIDS, and which turned out that he died of AZT, the medicine that was prescribed for AIDS victims. And that medicine was prescribed at the hands of Anthony Fauci in the 80s. And so way back then, people were accusing him of, of killing tens of thousands of people because he was pushing this medicine while there were other medicines that actually were safe and effective. He was really pushing hard this AZT, and it turned out to really kill the T cells and, um, to do the very thing that the virus was accused of doing. So it made things worse, and it killed you know, tons of people in Africa and beyond. And my brother's community, my brother was gay and his community told my mother and I, he said, they said, you, you, he, David did not die of AIDS, he died of the medicine. And so I never forgot that. And I met this woman named Judy Michaelvitz and she was finishing up a book and somebody introduced her to me and said, you might be you know, interested in directing her movie. She, she needs to be like an Aaron Brockovich movie. It's one woman up against the whole corrupt medical establishment. And so she came to my office and we talked and I loved her right away. I knew she was telling the truth right away. She's just that archetype of people that you just know. She's just, there's just no act at all. And she told me her story. I just sat completely silent for probably 90 minutes. And she told me her whole story. And I, I really wished that I could help her, but I was in the middle uh, at the moment committed to another documentary called The Narrative, which was to pull back the curtain on the mainstream media. Having been in the media for 30 years, I, I know the game and I knew what they were doing to our collective psyche. And I just thought it's time that we, you know, that we really reveal what's going on there because they really are doing the most damage on the planet and the way they're dividing people. And so I was in the middle of this documentary and I said, I, I couldn't really even consider this for at least another year. And, uh, and then I'd kind of forgotten about the project. And then the pandemic was announced and I knew right away. And I knew because the whistleblowers that were part of the narrative were telling me they were watching all of the signs and they were saying, beware, a false flag is going to happen very soon, which is an, a, a major um, um, concocted event to, to create an atmosphere of control and, and panic. And sometimes it's a, an event that will force us into war with another nation, whatever it might be. And so they kept saying this. Every, every whistleblower I was talking to said, something's gonna hap happen really soon. It's gonna happen this year. 
because too many things are being uncovered. And, um, and so suddenly the pandemic was announced and I reached out to the whistleblowers and I said, could this be it? And most of them said, it is it. And so I, I then called Judy Mikovits and I said, can, I, can we meet? And she only lived about 20 minutes from me. And I went and I sat down and I talked with her. And halfway in that conversation, I said, let's stop. Because I think what you're telling me is so important that it, we need to capture it on, on video. Let's, let's do an interview. Let's do a sit-down interview. <clears throat> and that's how it started. And she came to my office. We sat down and we recorded it. And I thought, at the very least, I'll go ahead and put it out on my Facebook page. But at the very least, it'll be a document for her so she can help get her movie made. Because I felt bad that I wasn't able to be there for her. And I'll cut it together and I'll give it to her and she can use it as kind of a promo to get her, get, get her movie made. And by the time I was done editing it, I realized, and things are developing within the, within the pandemic, that I realized this is, this is way more important than I thought it was. And we need to actually release this and do it right. It, the, people deserve to know this information. And I had done enough research to validate each of the claim that she made and said, wow, it's so contrary to what the media is saying. And I already knew the media was corrupt, but I just couldn't believe, you know, that they were going to the extent they were um, to destroy the, the very country that they live in. You know, each different, you know, national media, they, were, they would be willing to destroy their own economies, their own people and elderly. And I just, I, I thought, I can't, I can't believe it's this bad. I, I knew it was bad, but not this bad. And so we put it out there on May 4th, pushed the button and said, may the 4th be with us. And, um, and it did what it did and became the most um, viewed and censored piece of media in history. And, uh, and, and then we, we did number two to, to back that up. And so far, every, every single claim in both pandemics have been 100% validated. There's not been one claim. You know, hence our, our, our subtitle, which is 100% censored and 0% debunked. Now, I've seen the, the, the indoctrination, the second one. And I've got to say, Mickey, like, if what is said in there is factual, it's some heavy stuff. And for those that haven't, are you able to share the premise of what is in the, the documentary? Sure. Absolutely. So it, I had interviewed after the hype of pandemic one, I had access to doctors all over the world, a lot of Nobel laureates, Luc Montagnier, you know, who discovered AIDS and a lot of different, very, very notable people. And, and I interviewed all of them. And I was on, a, on about number 34 or five interviews. And people were reaching out to me saying, have you seen this David Martin guy? And they sent me some videos and I looked at it and it, he kind of went over my head. It was all about patents. And it wasn't really about COVID or anything. It was just a paper trail. And it was interesting, but, but you know, he's, he's so intelligent. And, you know, I, I just, <laughs> I, I'm not on his level. And, I, and I, I said, yeah, okay, I've seen it. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think it fits. And then somebody else would send it to me. And then it was finally one of my researchers who happens to be the son of Oliver Stone. His name is Sean Stone. He's a very, very intelligent guy and also a filmmaker. And he, he said, you, I know David, and you, you need to really take this seriously. The guy is brilliant. I said, all right, well, let's get him on a Zoom call and I'll do an interview. And halfway into the Zoom call, I stopped it and I said, you gotta, we gotta get you on an airplane right now, come to LA because this is, this is mind blowing what you're telling me. So pandemic two is, we, we, don't, we purposely stayed away from any of the hot button subjects. We don't talk about really that much about COVID. We don't really talk that much about masks or social distancing or all of that. Um, the only time we address COVID is in form of patents and paper trails and conflicts of interest. And so we, we literally show um, who's, who's funding things. It's all the stuff that's coming out now. So we got slammed by the media be, for being ahead of the curve. People couldn't believe because we said it is absolutely manipulated in a lab. And every single doctor I interviewed, I would ask him that question. And they would say, it's not improbable, but it's impossible. It was, it, you, don't, you don't get this sequence in nature and, and, and not in the time frame from which it developed. And so it was absolutely, in some way, it was manipulated in a lab. And so let's just start there. Well, that's interesting. And then, we, and then through David's work, we discovered that it was manipulated through gain-of-function research that was funded by Anthony Fauci, through the Eco Health Alliance, through the Wuhan lab. And it was all these cover organizations to hide it 
all the stuff that's just come out this year. And so we were just a, a year ahead of the curve. And, um, and then we took it further. You know, I, I, I went ahead and used pieces of what I was developing for the narrative and I threw them into the movie to really expose how the media works, how the fact checkers work, who funds them, how they're set up, just to help people understand that this, um, this, this onslaught of information that's pushed at us every single day is, is not to be trusted. If the media is all saying it, there's, there's typically, it's not to keep us informed and safe. It is to push an agenda. And I knew, as I said, I knew it was bad. I just didn't know that it was as bad as it is. And, um, and so we go deep with indoctrination. And again, every single claim has been validated. It's, it is, as you said, it goes deep, it's mind blowing. Um, but we actually played it safe. The stuff that we knew um, about population control and eugenics and all of that, I kept out of the movie um, because I didn't think people were ready to hear it. And now I see it's everywhere. Everyone's talking about it now, you know, and, and I didn't expect that they, people would wake up this fast, but it's, it is very, um, it's, it, it, I like the fact that, that we've accelerated the awakening, not we, but I mean, collectively as humanity. It's something that would normally take decades for people to wake up to uh, because I think they underestimated social media. They locked everyone in their homes with only the tool of social media. And what they did is they developed hundreds of millions of researchers, people that never, ever dug for their own information before that just tuned into their three favorite networks, decided to share information and, and to look deeper and to share videos. And, you know, just a year ago, I could blow people's minds. I could say, did you see this? And oh my God, they would look at something. And, and it was like, we found this through our deep research and I can't do that anymore. Now I show somebody and they go, oh yeah, I saw that. Oh yeah, that's Peter McCullough. Oh, that's Dr. Malone. Oh yeah, they're all hip to it. And it's, it's very promising to know that just average everyday mothers, fathers, grandmothers, whatever, they're doing their own research now. So I think it's changed us for the better in many ways. So how do we know you're telling the truth? Well, you know, because there's data to back it up. And, and so none of it's opinion. And if you look at indoctrination, I chose to, just because of the, that question you just asked, I realized that even though everything we said in Plandemic One was validated, I kind of assumed people would go and look for it themselves, but they didn't. The media said, don't look there, it's all fake. And then they went, oh, okay, cool, it's all fake. That, even though I know the media lies to us every day, I'm gonna believe them for some reason. Um, and so indoctrination, all of our research, we put it on the screen and we zoom in, we highlight it, we show it, patent number, date, where to find it. And so it left the media kind of stumped. All they could do is character assassination at that point, because now we have the research all up. Every claim we make, we go, here it is, boom, right in front of you. And so my answer to your question is, watch the movie and look at it and you'll see it. And if any of those points don't ring true for you, go down the rabbit hole, trust me, you know, thousands of people have done that. I offered a $10,000 challenge to anyone out in the world for six months after Indoctrination 2 came out or Pandemic 2 came out. And um, I had a lot of people trying to take my money, but no one did because they all would come back and go, damn, turns out that's true. Yeah. So, so that's really interesting. And, and this ties into my next question with regards to your book. So on, it's going to be available on Kindle uh, by the time this podcast comes out. Uh, it was released on the 19th of October, 2021. It's called Plandemic Fear is the Virus, Truth is the Cure. And I think available in hard copy looks like like December or January 1st, at least. No, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's available in, uh, in October. It comes out. It's available in hardcover and audio. Okay, great. It might be might be the Amazon Australian website that's saying a little bit later, oh. hard, maybe because of shipping. <laughs> okay. So, so there's a book that's been written that comes out, and I want to hear the story about the investigative journalist that was involved with this whole process. Yeah. Well, it it turned out to be a good thing, but it didn't start out looking that way. And so the quick story is my my producer Eric got a hold of me and he said, um. Uh, Dr. Michaelvitz's publisher wants to uh, do a book on pandemic, and I said, "Like, what? What kind of book would you do on pandemic?" And he said, "Oh, kind of like behind the scenes." And I said, "I don't. I wouldn't even be interested in that. I'm a filmmaker. I don't. I don't know." 
if I if that's a good idea. And you know what? I'm I, we're so busy fielding all the media and all the stuff that's happening, all the attacks. It's like I don't have time to do this right. So no, let's pass. And he got back to me and he said, Well, they have actually have an investigative journalist that will do all the writing. You just need to be available for a few interviews. And um, and they told me that some of the work she'd done. I said, Oh, wow, okay, she's legit. That's awesome. And I just have to be available for some interviews. Sure, why not? Why not? And um, and so I did an interview with this young lady, and I liked her a lot. And then every, you know, she interviewed David Martin and Judy and uh, the whole cast of characters. But about three months into it, my producer Eric called me and he said, well, I have good news and bad news. What do you want first? And I said, give me the bad news. And so he gave it to me and he said, turns out our investigative journalist isn't on our side. I said, what do you mean? He said, um, she believes the media. She thinks we're all a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists. And I, I was actually pretty pissed off. I said, oh, see, Eric, I said, that I had a feeling. I said, for some reason, I wanted to pass on this. And you, you kind of, you were pushy. And all right, here we go. Another hit piece. Wonderful. And he goes, you want the good news? And I said, yeah, what is it? And he says, uh, she thought we were crazy. She just called me and we had a long conversation. Her mind was blown. I said, what do you mean? He goes, she can't find one claim to be inaccurate. And she's kind of perplexed right now because she realizes that if she tells the truth that she'll be canceled. And she can't afford to do that. So she wants to um, be anonymous and she wants to tell the truth. And so I got on the phone with her and I, and I, I, I kind of pleaded with her. I said, you know, it'd be really wonderful if you revealed who you were. And she said, I might do that later. She said, but right now under the current situation, she said, I just can't afford it. I, I know what will happen. Um, and she goes, and I won't be as, as, as boldly truthful if, I, if they know my name. And I really want to tell the truth. She said, because what I have found is not only were you guys accurate, but it goes much deeper than you guys went. I said, oh, I know. And so at that point, I got very excited because I said, this is an interesting story now. And I said, but I don't think it's a behind the scenes of pandemic. I said, I'm not, I, I've never really, I allowed, I was allowing that to happen, but I don't, I wouldn't even be interested in that. I said, so why don't we, why don't I come in as co-writer and we take it deeper? And so we did that together and it was an incredible experience. And the outcome was beyond what I could even imagine. A very heartfelt, very deep. Uh, you mentioned the word spir spiritual earlier, and it definitely has a lot, a lot of roots in just really coming back to our nature as humanity also revealing a lot of bombshell information, but, but with laced throughout with a, a, a story that I think the world needs to hear right now, a story that, that has potential to, to heal the divide between friends and family. And that's, that was my goal with it. The, the information in the book, uh, in the, in the documentary is heavy. It's heavy. And even if you are in a good place to take on this information, it can still take its toll, certainly in my own experience. But what I've got to say, Mickey, is that, and I hope it's wrong, but I don't think it is. But what I would say is that now that I've gotten comfortable with the burden of knowledge, whatever you want to call it, it's very liberating. And, and looking at things through a lens, that, through the lens of my truth. And, and there's seven and a half billion people on this planet, each with their own, their own existence and their own experience of things. This is my experience. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the future. And this leads me to a question that I have for you. How can being open-minded more improve our lives well i love everything you just said it was beautifully stated because there is a liberating factor that takes place and as i said judy Mikovits was here this morning and part of our interview was looking at each other eye to eye her telling me that the 10 years that she's been tormented by our corrupt medical system has been the best 10 years of her life and this woman went through a lot more than i i've ever gone through having millions of dollars taken away from her. She was, she was a very successful scientist and she had three homes, all of them. She had, to, they forced her into bankruptcy. She lost two boats, homes, put her in jail for five days, everything that, that, 
Now I've met so many of the doctors who very similar things have happened to. But something happens, and I really appreciate your question because it is probably one of the most um, um, uh, important things to get across right now in the world. And that is, we have all been so conditioned to being liked. You know, our social media has like buttons and we all strive for how many likes the video got or whatever. And that, that's all social conditioning. That's to get us addicted to being liked. And there's something really powerful that happens when you step out in the name of truth. And you let go of that, that, that addiction. And everyone I know, We've all gone through some degree of hell. It's been a roller coaster ride. It's hard to see friends turn on you. Some of them come back, you know, because they go, wow, man, <laughs> I'm really sorry. But, you know, it turns out you're onto something. And I, it just seemed ludicrous a year or a year and a half ago. And now I see it. And that's wonderful. But a lot of them don't. And it, it can be hard sometimes to, to know, wow, a lot of people I love just went away. They're afraid. And even if they agree, they had to you know, flex to the public to distance themselves because they don't wanna, you know, they don't wanna be associated. And, um, but what comes as a result of staying true and not selling out? And I mean, it's really important that we don't sell out. It's highly important that, that I've had so many offers come through, $17 million offer for Plandemic for, to license the brand. And I've said no to all of it because we can't fight these greedy forces by becoming greedy our, our, our ourselves. And I have no issue with, with obtaining great deals of money. I, I, I don't mind anyone who does that, but I'm not going to capitalize upon this kind of a situation. 100% of my book proceeds go, go to a, a charity cause. And just because of that, we didn't turn on one, one commercial for Plandemic in a movie that's been seen a billion times, we would have made hundreds of thousands of dollars. Not one commercial did we turn on. But the thing that I want people to know is it's scary, it's uncomfortable. You definitely have to go through a little bit of hell. But the other side of that, like any initiation, any spiritual initiation is an experience that I didn't know existed in this life. This connectivity, this, uh, the authenticity of my new relationships, my new friends, this incredible growing connection between my children, my wife and myself, the feeling that I'm not just doing work and making money, but I'm actually serving the purpose that I came here to serve. It, there's a, how many people, I mean, it's, it's so cliche at this point of so many people that appear to be successful, but they're empty inside. And, and so I, I feel more full inside than I've ever felt in my life. We're not rich. It's not about the money, but we're, we have a, a comfortable home and, and incredible experiences with the people in our lives and they're authentic and real. And I now am flooded with the opportunity to do more of this work in the world. And so there's no more searching for the next job or anything. It's weeding through. Now we make decisions from what will have the most impact, not what pays the most or what will put us on this, you know, higher status in Hollywood or any of that. No more striving for Academy Awards. None of that crap matters. It's just what will move the needle and what can we do here in service in the purest of way? And so it's, uh, I wouldn't change a thing. Judy Michaelvitz said the same thing. I said, if you could rewind the clock and go back, would you change anything? Would you do it differently? She said, absolutely not. I do it all again because her, and, and she says this in, the, in a quote at the end of my book. She said, I thought I belonged in a lab. I was a science nerd. I never thought that my words could be my medicine that I could speak in front of a group of people and they would cry and be healed by something that I said. And she said, it's an experience that was far more gratifying than anything I could have produced in a laboratory. And so it sparked her purpose in her life. And I, I don't know anything other than maybe our children and our loved ones that, that could be more valuable than that. That's pretty cool, Mickey. That's pretty cool. 
How can people find you? Plandemicseries.com. That's the website that has all of our movies are for free. My book is on there too. And that links, I will say this, it links to Amazon. And I get a lot of pushback from people that, you know, think it's hypocritical. And believe me, I feel like it is too. And I wish I could bypass Amazon. But it's important for people to know that we are, as we wake up to this, the technocracy that has overtaken our lives, they, they own distribution right now. So if we're going to compete and to change the narrative, it's going to take a couple of years. And but right now we're at the mercy of these larger corporations that have the international reach to get the word out. So for me, it's more important that the message gets out there than it is that we that I avoid Amazon right now at this point. And so what we need to do is create new technologies. And I'm involved in new technologies. I'm working with an incredible journalist named Ben Swan, and we have a new platform called Sovereign that we're pushing together. And it's blockchain and decentralized and, and all these things are being created. I, I know about 20 people that are creating amazing technologies that have moved from big tech to create new things. And those will be live in a couple of years from now. And they, they, we won't need these other big tech platforms. Um, but right now, the, the harsh reality is we do. And so um, you can find me at pandemicseries.com. You can find the book on there and all of the films, um, including vignettes from each film, we, we, we pull them out of the film in case somebody wants to just share the 18 minute piece on, on Bill Gates or the WHO or the CDC or whatever it might be. And so they're all there and they're all free and it's subtitled in about 15 different languages. Do you have any concluding thoughts for our audience today, Mickey? <clears throat> well, my concluding thought was going to be what we talked about earlier, you know, just really getting out there with people um, and telling the truth and, 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 you know, dealing with the discomfort that comes with that. But since I've already said that, what I want to say is that there's a lot of bad stuff that's happening. And what is almost invisible to the eye is the good stuff that's happening. We're in the process of the great purge. And this is what happens when our, our bodies, when we eat something that doesn't belong in our system and it's toxic and it's really uncomfortable and it hurts and releasing that from the body, the, the purging stage is, is one of the worst parts of it. But the other side of that is wellness. And I believe from all of my research, from everything that I'm seeing, from the, the top level experts that I'm working with, I believe we're heading towards a wellness that we've not experienced in, in many, many decades or generations. And so it's important, though, that we all participate in that awakening and that regardless of what kind of power we think we hold or, or don't hold, that we, under, that we understand that it's, it's imperative that we all step forward and we start sharing the truth and we start to vote with our dollars. We don't support the systems, you know, and that's I realize it's I'm, you know, just had to talk about supporting Amazon. So it's a tough thing to do but that we start to really look at what we're supporting, how we're supporting it. <clears throat> and we look for new ways to return to nature. And I don't mean just, you know, let go of your home and go live in the woods, but to literally return to the, to the essence, the power of nature. We were given everything that we need. Our bodies are resilient and brilliant. And we have been steered away to this synthetic world, this digital world, and we need to come back into our trust of nature and tr trust in ourselves and each other to eat the right foods, to not absorb this depressing media all day long, and to stoop to the levels of, um, of, uh, of, of dialogue that has us at each other's throats all day long, but to start to listen to each other again, talk less, listen more. And if you're at odds with your family or friends over the situation, this whole situation has been created to divide us because it's a divide and conquer game. And um, I, I, I would recommend that no matter what you've said or what's been said, find a way to heal those relationships. Forgive, forgive yourself, forgive your friends, forgive your families and come back together, whether you agree with their ideologies or not, love them through it, let them love you through it. And by doing that, we'll like expedite this awakening. Ladies and gentlemen, Mickey Willis.